In this video, I do not intend to explore the underlying mathematics, but rather the underlying concepts around power analysis. Power analysis at its heart is a method within research design where we can estimate the required sample sizes for our experiment or survey. So let me start at the end. Let me start by showing you some typical sample sizes that you might come across in health research. For example, you'd require 25 participants per group if there was a large effect to be spotted, whereas a medium effect would require around 100 participants per group. And yet for a small effect, you would need a huge 1,500 participants per group. This is a huge range of possible sample sizes and clearly it's not up to us to pluck a number out of the air, but we have to think about how we can estimate sensibly the expected effect or rather effect size. Now in the research textbooks, it says that good research design must have sufficient power to detect the sought after effect. And that is of course, should that effect exist? So let's start with a simple question. What is power? It's often given the Greek letter gamma, but what is power? What does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean that. A nice one sentence definition is that power is the probability of detecting an effect, assuming that the effect really does exist. So it is at heart a probability. Now the power, this probability of our research design depends upon the interplay between two important issues. The first one is effect size. I've already mentioned this word effect but statisticians and researchers talk about the effect size, and it is generally an unknown. It's the thing we're trying to find after all. The power, that probability of finding an effect, also depends, unsurprisingly, on the number of participants, which of course is also an unknown, because after all, that's what we're trying to determine at the outset. Now, there are going to be some other concepts we'll need, but in order not to further muddy the waters, I'm going to worry about those later. So if we have insufficient participants, then we can't spot our effect. Or if the effect size is too small in order for us to see with our current sample size, then our research can be described as being underpowered. It does not have enough resolution to see the changes that are out there. So in many ways, you can think of all of quantitative research as if it was an instrument, a measuring instrument. And we've all heard the mantra that the greater the sample size you have access to, the better, or rather the more participants you have access to than the smaller the effect size you'll be sensitive to. This can be recouched as the more participants, the greater will be the precision of your instrument, of your research to detect ever smaller effect size. It's like a microscope compared to a magnifying glass. You can just see smaller changes with greater power. And I think that's quite a nice way of thinking about it. So therefore being underpowered would mean not having a precise enough measuring instrument to work with. Okay, time for some more concepts. You may have come across this idea of the null hypothesis in quantitative research. This is where there's an assumption that there is no real effect out there. So an example might be for Grumpy Cat here, the happy pills do not work. On the other side of the coin, we'll also have the, what's known as the alternate or experimental hypothesis, which is an underlying assumption that there is indeed a real effect. Whereas for his cousin Fluffkins, the pills do work. So taking those two concepts of the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis, the way statistical tests are constructed, we are therefore always hoping to reject the null hypothesis, disprove it, which is pretty much the same as saying we would therefore accept the alternate hypothesis. Or to use yet another take on a fun caption that will never get old, keep calm and reject the null hypothesis. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so we've already established that power is the probability of detecting an effect. So now we can re-express that as power is the probability of rejecting that null hypothesis, given that the alternative hypothesis is true. In other words, there is a real effect out there, so we now need to disprove the null hypothesis. Now in geek speak, in math land, they often like to couch things 
mathematically, so here it is expressed as a conditional probability. Power is the probability of rejecting H0 given that HA is true. Now think back to school days. When we learned about probability, we learned that all probabilities must add up to 1. So here we can say the probability of actually detecting the effect plus the probability of failing to detect the effect must equal to 1. I want to give you another symbol. We've already come across the Greek letter gamma for power, which is the probability of detecting the effect. I need to share with you another symbol, beta, which is the probability of failing to detect the effect. It's known as a type 2 error, which I'll explain in more detail in a moment. But from the previous slide, where the probabilities must add to 1, we can therefore say that gamma plus beta must equal to 1. Now that beta, I've already called a type 2 error, is also called a false negative. As an aside, this type 2 error, beta, is the probability of a false negative. And a nice way of looking at it is to think about the criminal justice system. It's where we would by accident acquit the guilty. And so, again, writing it as a conditional probability, you might see this in the textbooks, beta will be the probability of accepting the null hypothesis H0, but now, given that H0 is false, this is why it's called an error. We have made a mistake, we've made an incorrect conclusion. Okay, now, we know that gamma plus beta equals to 1, the two probabilities must add to 1. And I want to show you that very easily they can be rearranged as gamma must equal to 1 minus beta. That's not more difficult than saying 5 plus 3 equals 8, and then rearranging that as 5 equals 8 minus 3. So we haven't done anything too tough, but it's showing the intimate relationship between gamma, the power, and beta, this thing called a type 2, because we need to decide upon a value for beta in order to get a certain power out. In a lot of health research, a commonly accepted value for beta, this type 2 error, is 0.20 otherwise known as 20%. In other words, in health research, we'll typically be looking to accept, to acquire a power of gamma is 1 minus beta, 1 minus 0 0.2, 0 0.80. Gamma is equal to 0 0.8, otherwise known as 80%. So a power of 80% is a very common choice made by health researchers. In other words, we're accepting only an 80% chance of really detecting the effect, should that effect exist. Here's a picture of my favorite ex-president doing exactly this, a power analysis calculation. Actually, I don't think he is. I think he's applying it to business. Whatever. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking, hang on, why don't we insist on 100% confidence that we can find the effect? Why not a power of 100%? Like my favorite future ex-president here, Uncle Donald, why can't we be absolutely certain all the time of determining the truth. Well, it all comes down to that word chance or probability, as statisticians like to call it. You see, a great deal of research does indeed see a change between one group and another, e.g. an intervention versus control, or before versus after. But there's always the nagging possibility that that change we have seen was merely due to the play of chance and wasn't really due to our intervention at all. After all, everyone is different. So for virtually any measure you can think of, e.g. weight, height, blood pressure, life expectancy, etc., there will be a variation in the possible values that individual people could have for that measure. This is, after all, why they are called variables, because the underlying values person to person can vary. Research looks at the average values and whether the average value changes. So imagine we're carrying out some research and we have two groups. Now, the smaller the sample size, then the greater the chance that any change we see was only due to this underlying variability. In other words, chance may have been the real reason behind the observed change and not the effects of our wonder drug or therapy after all. So it's generally acknowledged that for most quantitative research, the more participants we have access to, the better. The idea being that the natural variability across the two groups will cancel out, leaving us more confident that any average change seen was indeed due to our intervention. This is the idea behind what is considered the gold standard of research, the randomised control trial. It's always important to consider context. 
So for example, if we're looking for a really important effect, e.g. does my daughter Lizzie smoke cigarettes, then a very small sample size of measurements can find it. In this case, one would do it. Now in general, however, due to cost, available time amongst other factors, we might have to make do with perhaps quite modest numbers in our groups, and we therefore have to accept some risk of getting it wrong, our attack to error. And power analysis is that subtle interplay between this risk and the very sample sizes that we might consider in order to make our research a success. So let's think about this thing, effect size. If we were to accept only an 80% chance of spotting the effect, an 80% power, this would be seen to be reasonable as long as the effect size is quite large and we could therefore have quite modest group sizes for our research to work. But if on the other hand the effect size is quite small, then with our modest sample size we may not be able to spot it. We may have therefore have a research design which is underpowered. However, if you think about it, if the underlying effect size is quite small, then maybe we should be asking the question, do we really care about an underperforming drug or therapy? Not spotting it will be the same as saying it isn't an important enough therapy or intervention for me to consider. In this case, a no result in a research can still say something important. In part two, I'll explore in more detail effect size, introduce the idea of a false positive, otherwise known as type one error, using an illustration from healthcare and give more examples around sample sizes.